Okay, awesome. Um, I basically want to want to talk about three common hypotheses I see out there in a lot of projects um, currently, especially around microservices. So the first is we want to want to talk briefly about event-driven architecture and, and basically the belief in that events decrease coupling, which is probably true, probably not. So let's let's have a look at that. Let's check that. And combined with that, very often we see that people think um, because of these event-driven systems because of decoupling and choreographed systems, probably orchestration should be avoided. So I want to check that in particular. And um, combined with that, a lot of people have the, the, the conception that workflows or BPM, all this kind of thing, doesn't have any place in, 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 in modern systems like microservices. And I also want to check that. So that's basically the agenda of what I want to do today. My name is Jabian Drücker, as you already said, as I'm co-founder developer advocate of Kamunda. We're a Berlin-based company. We also have offices in, um, in the US, and we're doing an open source workflow engine. That's my connection to the topic. And I'm traveling a lot, either to conferences or to customers, doing solution design, doing proof of concept. So I'm, I'm currently discussing these kind of architectures and also seeing these kind of problems a lot out there in the wild, and that's basically what I try to compile into, into these kind of talks. If you want to reach out to me, there's my email address, there's my Twitter handle. Um, we will run short in time at the very end, so we probably will not do questions in the, in the big room. Um, but there is a Kamunda booth out there. I will be at the booth till 3 p.m. today afterwards, so I have to leave to the airport, so if you want to talk to me there in person, um, hurry up a bit, and then that's no problem. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, one of the customers, um, one of the projects we do is, for example, Salando. They're not that known in the US, because they're not active in the US, but they're one of the biggest um, uh, retailers for clothes, shipping clothes and, and, and shoes, basically, to, um, to all over Europe. So they're pretty big. They're making around roughly 10 or probably even 50 million orders a month nowadays. So that's, that's quite a lot. And they um, also, they, they talk publicly about that last, um, last year in Berlin at a meetup, how they do their um, order fulfillment process. So the heart of the company, how the orders get to the customer. And basically, I use that as an example um, for what I do uh, today because I like examples. I don't like the like, like conceptual slides too much. I always try to do that with examples. And I use a simplified example, obviously, to make it very easy to get. And what I use is um, the Amazon Dash button. You probably know Amazon Dash. You just press it, and then you get some certain item one one piece of that item shipped to you directly. So you can, whatever, it could be paper, you attach it to your printer, you say, oh, the paper is getting empty, I press the button, I get a new box of paper. This is how it works. In the background, if we simplify that very much, we have a, um, basically a business process going on which looks more or less like that. I press the button, so I have to pay for the stuff, then it's fetched from the inventory, and then it's shipped to me, and then I'm happy, right? So that's what we have to do there, setting the scene. Um, how can we implement that? Let's assume the company does something around, um, let's say, microservices. We are in the microservices track. And then it could look like that. You probably know the concept of bounded context from domain-driven design. If that doesn't ring a bell, probably you should Google for it, not in my talk, maybe after the talk, but um, Google for bounded context, domain-driven design. Um, it's basically a good, good uh, methodology to, to find the right boundaries of these kind of services. It might look like that, probably different, but it might look like you have a checkout service, you might have a payment service, you might have an inventory and a shipment. That would more or less make sense, and these are probably your microservices. Or your services. Who's doing microservices? Really, okay, that's most of you. Who's doing SOA and thinks this is microservices? Okay, awesome. Um, so most of you are already doing something there. That's great. Um, so I don't have to introduce that, and I will not. I, I just want to emphasize what I think is the most important thing in microservices, and that's autonomy. So we're normally doing this because we want to have a high autonomy um, for different things. So we want to have like different applications and probably different servers. Um, we want to have different teams. Um, developing these kind of services very independently of each other, and probably also all the services store their own data locally, so every so no shared database or these kind of things, and that makes it possible to to evolve different parts of the system very independently. So that's one of the key promises of microservices. Okay, I don't want to go into that. For me, that's kind of the basis, um, for now. If we look at this, if we look at these kind of services, um, now the interesting question is how can we implement like this end-to-end -end business process? Like you click the button, you get the box. 
Well, there are a couple of things have to happen. How do we do that? And one thing which is really, um, let's say, famous at the moment, there's a lot of bus around event-driven architecture. I think that's a, for a good reason. And I'm pretty sure Jonas does a, does a really good job in making a case for event-driven in the next talk. So I definitely recommend to watch that. And um, how, how would it look like if I do event-driven? So let's make one example. So let's make one example where I press the button and then the button should, should probably blink green, for, for example, just that I get a good feeling um, if the order can be shipped within 24 hours. So that could be a, a, probably the dash button doesn't do it, but it could be something I want to have. And if I want to implement something, what would be the naive approach of implementing that? Um, very easy, I mean, the checkout component can make the button blink, but the checkout component doesn't know anything about the inventory, so probably it asks inventory because inventory has the knowledge of what is on stock. So I can ask. The um, naive approach would be request response, and if I say request response, it could be a synchronous REST call, but it could also be asynchronous message sending and message receiving. So I'm not talking about blocking synchronous calls here, but I'm talking about request response. I have to ask inventory, and then I get an information back, and then I can make the button blink. That's, that's a kind of a coupling I introduce here. Um, first, I have to know that I have to ask inventory and where I find inventory and these kind of things, but also kind of uh, temporal coupling. If inventory is currently not reachable, if it's not available, if it's currently down, I cannot make the button blink. Okay, so that's kind of a coupling which I probably wanna, wanna, wanna remove. And this looks very different if I do it event-driven. So if I go to, um, to the event-driven thing, um, it would look very different. So I could say, okay, the inventory, it publishes events whenever something really relevant happens. And what is relevant normally is something like, okay, I have new stuff on stock, and I currently removed something from stock. So I could publish these events to some kind of event bus or, or yeah, normally an event bus, and don't care who is interested in that. I just tell the world this happened, and checkout could say, oh yeah, I'm interested in that because I wanna, wanna store that locally. I wanna, wanna have a copy, basically, of the amount on stock in my local database so I can answer these kind of questions um, locally without asking anybody, for example, okay? So this is how event-driven could work in that example, and that is beneficial in this example. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's more or less a better architecture. It's always hard um, to judge from these small examples, but overall, I think that's a good idea to do here. Um, the thing is that it got um, really, really famous, and I saw a couple of systems or a couple of products now doing this on a, on a really large scale. And one thing um, that you can see is that if you have that event-driven thing on mind, and that's the old thing with the hammer and the nail, if I have the hammer, everything, I want to nail. And if I have this event-driven thing and I want to implement the end-to-end -end process, one thing that happens quite often now is that you, you implement this end-to-end -end process with um, basically event, um, um, subscription event notifications. And that would look like this. If I have the checkout service there, it could publish an event, hey, there was an order placed. Hello world, I don't care who is interested, but there was an order placed. Payment could say, yes, that's interesting for me because I know now I have to fetch money from the customer. And then payment says, yes, and now I uh, received the payment. And inventory says, oh, payment received, then I have to get money, uh, I have to get the, 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 the stuff together, um, and says, okay, the goods is fetched, it's ready to be shipped, and shipment says, oh, goods is fetched, so I ship, and says, okay, the goods is shipped, okay? This is kind of a, like a peer-to-peer, -peer, um, I call it peer-to-peer -peer event chain, okay? And this is, um, actually happens pretty often in this kind of architectures. Mm. And I think there are a couple of, let's say, at least risks when you do this kind of thing. So the first, um, one thing which really doesn't feel quite well here is that, for example, payment has to subscribe to something like order, pl order placed. Why doesn't payment has to know about order? If they, does, if they do payment for different things in the company, they have to describe to a lot of services, to a lot of events, which they should never know of. So that's already a bad smell. Um, another thing is, and that's, pretty, um, normally the most, one of the most pressing issues is that if you do this kind of thing, um, you basically lose sight of the, um, of the overall workflow, of the overall business process. So I've seen or talked to customers doing this kind of thing on a, on a large scale, having like, let's say, hundreds of microservices communicating. 
And they do this job somehow because it's often easy to, to develop this in the first place, but later on they have no idea how that really works. Why is it still working? Where to change it? And, and how is this chain um, really acting? So that's kind of a slippery ground to do this. And I, I was, personally, I was very happy last year as I saw one tweet from Martin Fowler. You probably know Martin Fowler, I guess. Pretty famous. Um, um, wrote a couple of books, writes a pretty good blog post, very clever guy, normally he writes really good stuff. And he wrote in that blog post, you have the URL there, the danger is that it's very, so it's basically a case about event-driven things, so the danger is that it's very easy to make nicely decoupled systems with event notification, that's a good part, right? Um, but without realizing that you're losing sight of a larger scale flow, and thus that yourself up in trouble for future years. So that's what you don't want to do, actually. And that basically sums it up, uh, what, what I have seen at a couple of customers as well. So that's kind of the risk. It probably works if you have like small event chains, then it probably works. But if, if they're really complex, if they're really um, basically implementing your core business processes, that might not be the best idea. Um, there's another thing, and that's also quite, quite visual to show. Um, so let's assume you get a requirement um, to change these business process here, to change, for example, the sequence of activities. Like, hey, we want to fetch the goods before we fetch the payment because we want to be faster. Things like same-day delivery or whatever it is. Um, so, so business could say, we want to, want to fetch it immediately and then we wait for the payment. If the payment doesn't work, okay, we bring back the stuff in the, in the stock, that's no problem. Um, so what's, it's basically a very, very easy requirement, just change that sequence. But if you look at the, um, the event chain, um, you will see that you have, uh, and you can imagine actually a lot of these kind of situations, even if the very often business processes are kind of stable. Um, in 2018, di digital um, um, disruption and all these kind of things, they are changing more often than you might think. So I see that changing very often. Uh, hang on, sorry, where we are. And if you want to implement that, um, you actually have to change a couple of things. And I like this effect. I actually like doing it. Um, <laughs> so what you can see is that you have to change, in this case, three services. So if you want to change the sequence here, you have to adjust payment, inventory, and shipment. It's better than doing synchronous rest. If you do synchronous rest, for example, you have to change the, the source or the beginning of the arrow then it would be four services. It's better than this, but it's still three services. And that's actually pretty bad. And why is that pretty bad? Not because it's impossible to change three services, but you also have to coordinate the deployment of them, for example. So if you change the sequence, um, you want to make sure that you always get payment and every, everybody that paid get, always gets the, the goods. And that's pretty hard if you change the sequence and you probably have messages going on and you have no idea where you are in the current process and you want to redeploy the stuff. So that gets quite complicated. And that's a very easy example. And that actually, um, one of my favorite pictures um, for the, basically the motivation of microservices, um, and that's, um, I, I basically learned that from, from Eric Evans, the, the guy who wrote the Domain Driven Design book. Um, this is a three-legged race. Okay, you probably cannot really see that, but always two people are bound together by their feet, and then they have to run. It's kind of a game. But um, what you can easily imagine is, first of all, everybody runs slower than they would run if they run on their own. And the risk of falling down is much higher. And that's actually what we try, exactly why we do microservices. We try to avoid three-leg traces between teams. You don't want to coordinate with other teams for deployment or for, for upgrades or whatever, because if you do that, you slow down everything and you, you um, increase the risk of falling down. So what we do there with, with exactly this thing here, that's, that's a three-leg race, and we combine together like three teams, for example, and that's exactly the contrary that we want to do with microservices. So in this case, the event chain we do increases the coupling actually in a very bad way. And that's something um, which is important to have in mind. It's, it's actually very natural when you think about it, but I, I haven't seen that applied in practice very often. Most of the projects, when they start microservices event-driven, they just go event-driven all in, and then they do these kind of architectures, and they end up with like recognizing that when it's actually too late. So that's a very important thing. Not, not hard 
to get around it, the only thing you'd have to do in this example is um, you extract that end-to-end -end, um, business process, for example. So in this case, it would be very natural to have like an order service. I mean, that's the order, if we think of Zalando or Amazon or whatever it is that ships stuff, um, ordering things, order fulfillment is one of the core business capabilities of the company. It should be reflected somewhere. So it's good to have this kind of order service. Um, then the picture looks different. You can still do event notification, like Checkout says, hey, there was an order placed. But now order listens to that and says, oh, order placed. So the first thing we have to do is to retrieve payment. And this, kind, what I do, uh, this time what I do is not doing event notifications, but really commanding somebody. Like I say to payment, do the, retrieve the payment now. I tell you, please do that. And then payment probably again um, issues an event, like payment received. And you probably um, listen to that and say, okay, the next thing that has to happen is inventory, and so on and so on. And now it's much easier to change these kind of things. And the only thing we basically introduced is this, this, this notion of a command. That's very, very, very easy to get normally, but very often forgot. Um, when I say command, what happens, I, Pretty often in, in, in discussions, like on-site discussions with customers, is that somebody stands up and say, oh, commands. Um, oh yeah, commands are great from my perspective. Um, but somebody stands up and say, okay, commanding, commanding is orchestration. You tell somebody else to do something, and I have this order service telling a couple of other services what they have to do in, or in which order. That's orchestration. And the orchestration um, term had a basically a hard time over the last year, so a lot of people um, basically back off orchestration. Why? So far, um, as I can see, it, it's basically because um, we had that SOA and BPM stuff like five or 10 years ago. And what happened in the, in the let's say, ancient SOA times that you typically had some middleware like an ESB which was pretty smart, actually. So, so you had that middleware of the ESB, which also has like a messaging system, and you can probably put all the events there. Most of the time, we didn't have events at the time, but let's assume we have events. Um, and then in this picture, what, what very often happened is that these kind of, um, like, let's say, vendor-driven architectures had the ESB, and that ESB has a BPM engine or whatever it is, BPM suite, right next to it. And then you... Um, basically implemented the orchestration logic, the order process within um, kind of the middleware, somewhere beside the whole thing. And that never didn't really work for, for different reasons. Um, one of the reasons here, um, which we can probably point out, is that um, in this case, it, it's a three-leg race again because I have a different team caring about the BPM stuff. I have a different thing. I have to do coordinate two deployments. It's not a good idea. Um, but I haven't drawn the picture like this. This is important. I, I have the picture, actually, I have the order as an own microservice, right? It's an own microservice. You can implement that however you want. The important thing is that it still orchestrates other services. And you need to have that. And it's not a bad thing. It's not evil at all. It's very important to have that in mind. And then you can follow that, what uh, is also very famous, and you probably know that, also from Martin Fowler. He said, smart endpoints and dump pipes. So quite a while ago, but very... Um, still very accurate. So we try to make that event bus as dumb as possible. It just basically just forwards event, not, not much more. And th then you have orchestration logic in the order. So far, so good. Then you probably, if you do microservices, you probably can come across um, Sam Newman. Sam Newman wrote the O'Reilly book, um, Microservices. So probably know that. That's a pretty good book. I can definitely recommend it. But he wrote something which really um, caused me to do a lot of discussions at customers. And he basically also warned um, of orchestration. And he wrote something that, OK, if you have these kind of orchestration services, what might happen is that um, you end up with, and, and that's a quote, a few smart God services telling anemic CRUD services what to do. So if I picture that, it looks like this, right? So all the services are not really doing anything, but the order service is consuming all the business logic. And that, it's, it's actually true what happened in the past if we saw these kind of BPM projects, and that happened very often. So they have like these huge like, business processes consuming all the logic and payment doesn't do anything. But it doesn't have to happen necessarily just because you have that orchestration service. So 
Um, from my point of view is that these God services, you, you might get them if you do a bad API design, basically. And what do I mean by that? Let's make the example again. Um, so we have order and we have a payment service. So let's assume um, what I said earlier, we send a command from the order to the payment service. And by the way, it doesn't matter again if that's asynchronous or it could even be REST, talking about REST in a sec. Okay, so um, I send the command, I say payment, hey, please retrieve something for me. What does payment do? Payment normally doesn't do that probably itself. So if you're, if you're familiar with payment things, so we have one customer there, I think, Payment only is like 100 microservices because it can be quite complex. Um, but let's make an easy example. We are using an upstream service like Stripe or whatever it is and just call that. And now what could happen is that it rejects the credit card. It's expired, it's invalid, it's for whatever reason I get an error. And now the important question is what do I do with that error? And what I see happening very often is like the naive approach is just, oh, we can charge the credit card so we fail the payment. And if you do this, you start going towards a direction where you make the order to a God service because now the order has to, to think about, oh, there was a credit card rejection. What do I do? Do I retry that? Do I whatever? There, there are a couple of things which you probably have to do. It would be a much, and, and now think of requirements like, um, what you see, for example, if you're using GitHub, if you have a GitHub account, they charge you the um, annual fee on your credit card, and th if this doesn't work, they send you an email saying, hey, um, your credit card didn't work, no worries, you have 14 days to update it. And there are other scenarios wh where this might make sense. The customer has ordered, I wanna actually, I wanna have this, his money, so I wanna send out the stuff, and if the credit card doesn't work, I give him a second chance. And if I wanna do something like this, in an architecture like that, the only way I can do that is to, to have it in order. I, I, in the order microservice, I now have to implement these kind of things. And that's not very, where it um, belongs to. What's the alternative? I think it's very, um, very um, intuitive. So the first thing is I always have to ask myself who is really responsible to, to care about these kind of problems? Who should resolve that? In this case, um, you might not agree with me with in this case, but very often, um, in this case, it's the payment, okay? So if I have the rejection and the payment should deal with that, and what I, what I, what I wanna have from payment is like a, like a final result, like either payment received, all good, or payment ultimately failed. And then order can work with that. Either I ship or I don't ship. But I don't have to re reiterate over payment or retry or ask the customer to update his credit card. That's now all responsible of responsibility of payment. And this is the way how you, how you avoid these kind of God services. Uh, so it's all about the API design, what you do there, because now I have an API where I say retrieve payment and the only response I can get is either received or ultimately failed, nothing more. And that's a good API design and that will give a good service. The problem you have, as soon as you do that, now, I, I, I wrote something, uh, the, the customer can provide new details, and I probably give him what I said with GitHub, 14 days of time. Now I have the notion of time, I probably have to wait. And um, that's what I call long running, or I um, actually tend to call it potentially long running. Why? Because in the good case, it might be like milliseconds or, or whatever. Um, only if something bad happens, it gets really long running, and by long running, um, it's, it's sometimes confusing. Long running basically means waiting for some time. But it means that the payment service can take, take its time until it's finished, even days or, or, or weeks to finish. That's normally a necessity to get the good API to avoid these kind of God services. And the thing is, um, I, I mean, then um, you're, you're into state handling which is um, we have 2018, shouldn't be that hard to handle state. So what you, could you do? And that's actually the naive approach what the most of the people are doing in these kind of situations. You store what I call a persistent thing. Could be basically everything. Could be an entity like whatever, JPA if you're, if you're in Java, um, the database table with whatever access you wanna have. So this is the most obvious one, but it could be also a document, it could be, um, uh, we're, we're, talking also about a, 
probably also a bit about actors today, um, could be persistent actors. So that depends on the architecture. But the thing is, you have to do it yourself. You have to do the persistence yourself. And that also means you have to take care of a couple of things. And that's um, where I see a lot of people backing off the idea. They say, OK, I understood this. I want to do that. Um, but now I have to ha I basically have to implement a lot of stuff in payment to get that going and that's very often that's true because you have to probably have to do some scheduling in order to get the 14 days to, you have to have some timing mechanism you have to operate that probably at scale um, and so on and so on and so forth so there are a couple of things you might run into if you do that like in the naive approach and that brings us to, to the next hypothesis I want to change uh, I want to check there are actually tools out there which can handle exactly this kind of problem. They are named um, normally workflow engines nowadays. That's a state machine. A state machine is exactly for handling state, so that's why the there's a name. But um, if you propose something like this, normally you get the conception, okay, workflow engine, no, I don't want to use that in microservice architectures, don't I? That's like from the past, it's these BPM stuff. I don't want to use that, that's really painful. Um, what I, I normally use this picture of like big vendors selling stuff in a zero code manner like or no zero code is, is, is out they, they understood that zero code doesn't work low code now it's mentioned low code and that's great because you can do everything without the developers involved you can click together everything this is how it was sold it normally leads to um, what I call death by properties panel because you have to click through a lot of wizards in, in, in order to get something going you can cannot just code your head way ahead or copy and paste anything from the internet, some recipes or whatever. So that's a really bad, bad thing. And these kind of tools, they're really complex, normally very proprietary, and so on and so forth. Um, the thing is, just because the big vendors screwed it up in the past, it's not, not a good reason to throw away the whole concept. And that's what's happened the last years. Um, the good, good news is that um, we can see that the market is really um, um, moving at the moment. So if you look at the workflow engine market, there are all the big cloud vendors are doing something. Um, foremost, Amazon with the so-called step functions. It's a state machine, it's a workflow engine with their own um, language, but the other cloud vendors are doing something very similar. Um, the Silicon Valley stacks are doing something, like with Uber does something with Cadence, it's in Go and Cassandra, or Netflix is doing something with Conductor. And Conductor deserves a second look, so I have um, the, the original blog post from the Conductor launch. You can look that up on the internet as well. And they wrote something which I think is pretty, pretty reinforcing to what I'm also saying here. So um, traditionally, some of these processes, they're talking about what kind of processes they're, they're, they're doing with that, uh, had been orchestrated in an ad hoc manner using a combination of pops up, making direct address calls, and using a database to manage state. So these are the typical things, right? You're using asynchronous, you're using synchronous REST, or probably a database. Um, but peer to peer. However, as the number of microservices grow and the complexity of the process increases, getting visibility into the distributed workflows become difficult without that central orchestration. So this is exactly the motivation for Netflix to doing something like this. The, um, probably one problem you get if, you're, if you want to go with Netflix conductors is that you're having to move into the Netflix universe, like Dynamite DB and a couple of other things. So it's not that easy to get going, but it's um, probably an alternative to, to have a look at. Um, there are also a couple of open source engines out there, um, especially in the Java space, but there are also uh, normally available like with uh, either language clients or remote interfaces for, for other languages, um, which are actually very, li very lightweight and, and very easy to use. And um, um, that's actually a good, good, um, good way to go into these kind of, to solve these kind of problems. One thing I um, don't have any time to go into, but I wanted to highlight it um, because I'm really, really uh, amazed by what, what's happening there. There's an open source project. It's by the company I co-founded, so that's kind of... A, thing, but I, I wanted to highlight it in any way. It's an open source only, so it's not a product, nothing. It's an open source project. And what we currently do there, um, we're, we're teaching workflow engines to be really horizontally scalable. We are basing on event sourcing, basically. And this makes it either very, uh, 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 very fast and also really horizontally scalable. And there we are currently already doing things like uh, millions of workflow instances per second. So um, because 
whenever I talk about these kind of things, people also start thinking, okay, you do this microservice orchestration, but we're having a lot of traffic in our microservices. Can a workflow engine really handle that? And this is currently what's happening. So if you have questions about that, ask me later on. Um, but for today, um, I, I don't go into a lot of code, so, and I have it on the slide. I hate code on slides, but I don't have the time for live coding, but you can visit me later on. I can do all that live. But I wanted to have some code to demonstrate what I mean by lightweight. And in this case, I use Java and I use the Kamunda engine, uh, but it's comparable if you use others, just to give you a very concrete uh, uh, impression what that means. And that could be like, um, in one line of code, you can start a workflow engine. In this case, with an in-memory workflow engine with an in-memory database, probably for testing or whatever. But you can start a workflow engine in one line of code. Then you can define your workflow, like what should happen, like the orchestration flow, for example. And that's, in this case, we're using BPMN, create the flow, um, start here, start event, then we do a couple of steps. This is the graphics, which, which I do here, and then I'm done. The important thing here is you can define um, all these kind of workflow models graphically. Do I have a wrong watch? No. Awesome. Um, graphically. But you can also define it in code. And I normally like to show the code first because a lot of developers I know are very often scared of graphical models. There's some complexity hidden behind. But that's not the point. You can define it like this in Java, in, in YAML, whatever. Um, but you can very easily define it. And then, for example, um, yeah, we are using um, BPMN. That's also important, BPMN. I love BPMN. I wrote a book about it, but um, it's, it's a pretty good language. It's pretty powerful. We'll see that in a second. So it's a good standard. It's an ISO standard. It's nothing proprietary. A lot of vendors support that. A lot of open source products support that. So it's worth to have a look at that. And then what you can do is like, on the, uh, whenever you run through a step, you can attach Java code. In this case, it's Java code. If you're coding in another language, it's a bit different. And this is the code, this gets executed, that's not that interesting anymore, and then you can start workflow instances. So on that slide, you have everything. You start up an engine, you define the flow, you deploy it, it's versioned, you start instances, and it's executed. So that's it, that's what I mean by lightweight. It doesn't have to be more complicated. And then you have the state machine, and the state machine is pretty powerful, so, and this, by the way, is BPMN. I don't explain BPMN in, 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 in like a lot of details. Um, but it's normally relatively easy to understand. So what I can do here is like I charge the credit card, and if I say if the credit card was rejected, then I inform the customer to update the credit card, and the next thing I, I do, I wait for him to update it. Now I can model that, and I, I have the notion of time um, where I say I wait for seven days. If he doesn't do it in seven days, I do something else. And that's very easy to implement. Now you can do these kind of long-running services, which allow also to, to define better APIs and to basically to, to make a better service there. OK. And this is, yeah, this is the, the moment where, where it persists. It's stateful, so it survives every crash, every restart. It's a state machine. It should survive, obviously. Yeah, I said that. Um, if you look at it, by the way, from the angle of domain-driven design, which probably who knows domain-driven design? Quite a few, probably 30%. The others, that could be also be a good idea to read through the book. It's a pretty good book. And also event storming is quite interesting to find basically to, to a good methodology to, to define which, how the process should be implemented probably later on. And if you look at it from that perspective, a good friend of mine, he did a, at the CraftCon in, in Budapest, we did a talk together and he had that slide. So. Um, What's very natural for the most people if they design a service to have something like, I have the place order to, reme to return something immediately, like an atomic operation, which might be even transactional. Um, but I also have these composite long running executions like place order till order fulfilled, which is really long run. And you should have something in the toolbox for both, and then it can get a good architecture. Awesome. Um, quick. Only a quick hint on synchronous communication. So, um, no, let's ask that. Let's ask that. You're, you're in the talk for event flows, so probably got the idea that's about eventing. But who is using eventing? Who is using messaging, at least? Who is doing REST? Okay, still here in the talk, more people are doing REST than they're doing asynchronous communication. That's what I see basically everywhere. Um, 
I don't want to chat that for now. We can chat about that later on. But if you're using synchronous communication, by the way, you get similar problems, even if I look at it from the event-driven angle. So let's assume, again, you do the payment and call the upstream REST um, credit card service. Um, you might face problems like um, the service is not available, right? Stripe, for example, remote service not available. Internet is not your best friend, so it doesn't work. We can tell from the Wi-Fi here at the conference. So internet does not always work. Um, so um, what, what, the same thing, if you now transport that arrow like, oh, I cannot charge the credit card for a network reason back to the order. The order gets a God service. No, you should handle that within payment. Um, yeah, and it gets a God service. Um, you should handle that within payment. And again, um, this might be stateful. Because if the, serve, the peer is not available, you might have to retry even for minutes or hours for a longer time. Same thing, stateful, you have to introduce something to solve that. And obviously that could be like a state machine or virtual. That makes a lot of sense for you. Okay, let's quickly talk about distributed systems. And that's a, um, a metaphor I, uh, motivated by Jonas as well, so I, I'm pretty looking forward to his talk as well. Um, where this small hut, that's one service like in Java or whatever, there you're on one JVM on one um, um, computer, you have transaction management, everything is cozy in there, it's pretty cool to be there. And whenever you open the door, you have a network. You probably know the eight fallacies of distributed computing, and one is the network is reliable. No, it's not, of course not. And that may, there, you get problems by this. One um, which is really um, interesting to look at is, if you call a remote service, and you get like either a network error, and if you, if you do REST call and you get a network error, or if you send a message and don't get a response message. You have no idea, you cannot differentiate these three problems, like either you never reach the service provider, or you reach the service provider, it blew up while processing your request, or it did his job and you didn't get the response. It's not possible to, to, to really um, differentiate these kind of pro situations. And that causes problems like um, if I do the payment, for example, here, and I call the upstream REST service, um, and I probably even do the stateful retry I talked about, and at some point in time I say, I give up, I don't retry anymore. I raise that, what I said earlier, the ultimately payment failed event. I probably charge the credit card in this scenario if it's REST, or if it, even if it's messaging, I don't get a response. I probably charged it, I have no idea. I have to think about these kind of situations. It could be that I just issue a refund, for example, or that I ask if I did something or whatever, but I have to clean up. It's an inconsistent incons state, and most people I know out there are not aware that this already can be a really inconsistent state, that I probably charge the credit card. With payments, most of the time people start to think, oh, that's real money, that's probably, I have to think about that. But for other scenarios, it's very often the same problem. Brings me to another, um, actually my favorite topic, I love the topic, I'm, I'm, I'm also having a talk, not, not here at QCAN, but I called it Lost in Transaction. And um, yeah, it's, I mean, we entered the world of distributed systems, and we entered that quite a while ago, but what we see is that nowadays everybody is doing it all over the place. And one thing that's really bad there, um, we don't have transactions. We don't have asset transactions anymore. So asset transactions, the real transactional guarantees we know from a database, are there in the hut, only in the hut, not over the place. There are, there are things like distributed transactions, two-phase commit, three-phase commit, Google Spanner. There are a couple of things which are going on, but it simply doesn't work at the moment. There's great paper which kind of proves that. It's a bit outdated as well, but it, no, it's not outdated. It's quite, from, quite a while ago written, but it's still very accurate. Um, so I recommend reading that if you, think, if you don't believe me that um, distributed transactions don't work. I would assume distributed transactions don't work in a distributed system. So, um, but I have the requirement. I mean, I have consistency requirements in my distributed system. I showed basically one, this is a consistency requirement that I probably charge the credit card so I have to clean up. We have others like I wanna do three things in a row. If the third thing blows up, I wanna, wanna 
um, roll back the other to how do I do that in, 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 in these microservice architectures? And the typical answer, probably not the only answer, but a very typical answer currently is also known as the um, saga pattern. So there, there are a couple of people talking about the saga pattern, like in, in, in the US, Chris Richardson is doing a lot of talks. Katie McCaffrey from Microsoft at that time did a couple of talks. Um, and that basically is always the idea of um, basically pushing it to another level where you say, okay, I have these, these activities I do, but if I want to roll back, I have to undo them. I cannot roll back them in an asset kind of way, but I can call uh, undo activities. And in this example, it's like um, the first thing I do, I probably deduct some credit from the customer account, and if then the payment is complete, uh, I have, don't have to do anything, but if not, if there's a rest to be paid, I charge the credit card, and if that gives a failure, what I can do is I can raise the compensation, and I can define for every activity a compensation activity which will be executed in that case. And that's defined by the BPMN standard. Every BPMN engine can do that for you, and it's automatically done in the background. And again, if, for example, a distributed system, the customer credit service is not available at that time, you can retry it. You can do that reliable, and that's very important. And that's um, having these kind of undo um, functionality known as compensation in BPMN is very important for consistency in these distributed systems we don't, because you don't um, have distributed transactions like asset transaction or two-phase commit. So that's actually pretty cool. Of course, we relax consistency um, uh, here a bit. So we might be in an inconsistent state in the, mean, uh, in the meanwhile. We basically don't have the, the isolation as an asset. So it's, it's a bit different to what we know. But we um, all know that from real life out there. So my, my favorite example is Airbnb. When I book something on Airbnb and I use a voucher, they invalid, invalidate the voucher right away. It's gone. But I haven't yet confirmed my booking. So the peer has to confirm it. Um, if he doesn't confirm it, they reactivate my voucher. In between, I don't have something to live and don't have the voucher. It's inconsistent, but it's okay. We are used to that. And it's more or less we have to get used to these kind of things. Very important. Um, okay, so that was um, uh, basically the um, um, workflow engines are painful part. So, and what I, what I wrote on Newstack recently is that, um, and I quickly go through that, so what, I, what I'm basically doing here on what we are currently seeing at the customers is that these kind of state machines are used for a lot of use cases where the most people don't have that in mind. So what's very common is that you think about like the business processes, like the order orchestration. That's something people think of workflow engine. Yes, this is an order business process. I have to automate it. But um, you can solve a lot around orchestration of microservices, a lot about um, distributed transactions consistency, and you can also solve problems like these communication problems, stateful retry, and so on and so forth. So there's much more in that um, than you might think of in, at the first place. Okay, awesome. And then you get, I, um, I make that very quick because I'm running short in time, and then you get other advantages as well, like I, I call that BIS DevOps. So you probably know DevOps, um, and I, I have the business as well there because I think it's very important for these kind of um, complex event flows to really have the business involved. And then you get a lot of advantages like, um, okay, the developers get their state machine to handle state. They don't have to fiddle around with the entity themselves. They get um, a lot of visibility. So for example, um, we have done something like this in, in projects where we visualize test case runs. So if you run test cases throughout the scenarios, we visual, visualize them in BPMN, and then you can see where it broke. That's also for, for the developer um, at hand, it's very handy. Or um, for the business, obviously, they can a bit under, start to understand what this is about. I mean, typical business folks can understand that. And for operations as well, um, yeah, living documentation, obviously. And for operations as well, um, because you get a lot of visibility, like what's currently going on in the system, you get a lot of statistics, what, what normally works and what doesn't, and these kind of things, so, so on and so forth. Okay, and we got a lot of, um, actually, I like the quote from Jimmy here from 24 Hour Fitness in the US, and they're, they're using that 
all over the place. So you can see there, if you have good eyes, they're using more than 20 million of um, activity instances a day on such a workflow engine. And they're doing everything with BPMN. And they're so happy that they, they start to see something. This visibility thing is really important that you um, don't code the stuff uh, too deep in, in, in the system. Um, one very important thing, um, and that's for, for some people, that's probably the most important slide, actually. It's very, very, very late, but it's, um, it's very important. So if you think about that, um, I had that payment flow, right? It's part of the payment service. It lives within the payment service. Um, it's nothing like central, no central engine, no like um, huge monolithic process. It lives within the payment service. And then probably the order also has kind of an orchestration flow, but it's totally independent. It doesn't have any details of payment. And again, autonomy of teams. So even the teams can use like different tools, different methodologies. If you want to hard code it in order because that's fine for that use case, it's, it's awesome, it's okay. You don't have to have something central. Okay, that's very important. And then you can run it like, like technically there, there are a lot of options. We, we skip the options there. There are a lot of options. So that's actually great technology. I think that that's make very much sense. And if you look at it, what, what, what Salando is doing, I started with Salando, it's more or less that. What they're using underneath, it's, it's Kafka as an event bus. And then they're having these kind of flows talking to Kafka and doing it very event driven, but also issuing the commands whenever that's appropriate, whenever that makes um, a lot of sense. And they're doing quite, quite a lot of things with it, what I said earlier. Um, we're not really having, uh, we're having we're having two minutes for the live demo, probably. Um, so what I have is, is, because I love code, actually. I, I like concepts. Concepts are important, but I love to see them in code. Otherwise, it's hard for me to really understand them. Uh, I have it on GitHub. There's an example showing exactly what I had on the slides today. So there are a couple of services, all in um, Java and Spring Boot or in C Sharp, if you like. I have the same stuff in C Sharp as well. Um, they're running um, um, an engine in order and payment, exactly what you saw. And yeah, Kafka underneath. And if you run that from, a, from, from the end user perspective, I can have this. Um, I have a, short, a small monitor just, just looking into um, the Kafka, what events are going on there. And the next thing I do is I can basically um, do an order. That's the cool thing. That's why I selected the dash button. I can build a UI for that. And <laughs> can, can place an order. Oh, no, I have to connect the WebSocket first. OK, let's place another order. OK, there we are. And then I see, OK, there was an order placed event. I, first thing it, is, it does, uh, retrieve payment, then payment received, then it fetches good, and then it stops. Oh, that's interesting. Why does it stop? So um, now you can also have a look why this event flow stops. So if you look in order, for example, then you have these workflow engine. You can look into these kind of workflow engines. Don't want to want to go into too much detail. It's not a Kamunda demo. Um, um, so I see it's waiting for the goods to be fetched. Why I haven't started the service, actually. So if I start the service, it comes up, it consumes the fetch goods command, and then it will move on. If that takes too long, I do something else. And why did I do these strange lines here to remind me of one important thing I wanted to show, actually. Um, and that's pretty hard to do without this kind of orchestration logic. If you do peer-to-peer -peer event chains, it's close to impossible to do these kind of things. Um, no, it's, it's possible. It's very, 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 a lot of effort. You can do versioning. The example from earlier, I changed the order of retrieve payment and fetch goods, changing the order. I could do here easily and then like um, running workflows of the, of the old version are keeping the order intact and this is how it works and um, new versions are using the new version and you can, you can even migrate on that. So there are a lot of things you can do there. Um, Code-wise, I don't jump into that. Um, it's on GitHub. Um, it's basically like 10, 20 lines of code in order to, to receive a message and, and map it to the workflow and the other way around. And that's the same for other tools as well, by the way. So it's, it's really um, quite generic. OK, so um, as a summary, events decrease coupling. Yes, I'm actually personally a big fan of event-driven architectures, but I think you have to be aware that at least don't do events only, so you need commands at, uh, at some points. Don't make all these purely complex event chains. That's really important. And um, orchestration needs to be avoided. I don't think so. I mean, um, orchestration doesn't have to be something central. You need this command and you need orchestration. It might be part of some of your services, and that's very vital to get a good API. You need these potentially long-running services, and therefore you need also state machines. And yes, there are tools out there which are really crap 
especially in the past. But um, don't let you annoy you by that. There, there is new technology coming from, from a couple of vendors, from a couple of open source projects, which really makes sense to use there. Um, awesome. I think I'm right. Yeah, I'm right on time. Awesome. Um, there are um, some links, some uh, uh, references, my, my contact data again. If you have any questions, send me an email or approach me at the booth. Thank you for coming. I hope that was helpful. Thank you.